We live in an eternal sea of radiation, a natural part of our environment. Every time my little gyro counter here clicks, it's because the tiny gas-filled chamber inside of it has been struck with a gamma ray of nuclear radiation. Pretty much everything on Earth has some radioactivity in it, which means that it emits nuclear radiation. Most of it comes from the Earth's crust itself and the things we take out of it, like bricks and granite. But it also rises cosmic rays rolling in from distant stars, as well as from our food and even from our own bodies. When these rays, which travel at the speed of light, collide with our cells, they can shred our DNA, but our cells then repair it and carry it on. This damage and repair cycle happens inside each and every one of us thousands of times per minute. And all life on Earth evolved in this constant barrage of radiation. Humans are 120 years into the project of studying the impacts of radiation on the living world. And I think it's fair to say at this point that we've studied the shit out of it. Radioactive cobalt is about to be raised up from a lead vault below ground. Gamma rays, like all other forms of radiation, are most intense nearest the source. Most of the experiments have focused on very high doses. The uh, cage is put in a movable mechanism which sends the animals into the beam, and then, of course, they are radiated. Some experiments were morally questionable, others were straight up sadistic. This was the means to get at the facts. And now all we need is time. Time to trace the intensity and effect of radioactivity through every type of life at Bikini. For all the experiments that have been done exposing life to increased amounts of radiation, very little has been studied on removing the radiation that we're always exposed to and seeing what impact that has on living organisms. But today we're gonna visit just such an experiment. First, I just want to lay out the stakes a bit more. The experiment could help settle a long-standing debate on the effects of low doses of radiation. Basically, the debate has two ends to its spectrum. On the one end, we have what's called the linear no-threshold hypothesis, which basically states that all radiation is dangerous, higher doses, higher danger, lower doses, lower danger. On the other end of the spectrum, we have something called hormesis, which is basically the idea that a million gamma rays a day keeps the doctor away. They propose that since all life on Earth evolved in a bath of radiation, it makes sense that we do best with a little bit of it. You might compare it to muscle building. When we lift something heavy, our muscles tear and then repair and come back stronger. The hormesis camp would say that something similar happens with our cells and radiation. So we headed to one of the few places on Earth carrying out this kind of scientific work, the Snow Lab in Sudbury, Canada. If the all radiation is bad camp is correct, then life should prosper in this no to low radiation environment. Meanwhile, if the hormesis camp is correct, then life will struggle in this low radiation environment. The stakes are simple enough. What turns out to be the difficult part is creating a low radiation environment. To start, you have to get real deep into the Earth's crust, two kilometers deep, in one of the deeper mines on the planet, where the mass of solid rock above you can act as a filter to keep out the cosmic rays constantly bombarding the Earth. There's no filming allowed during the elevator ride down to the mine, but basically it's the equivalent of a subway at full speed going straight down. Then we walk through the mine in our minor costumes, I call them costumes because they were way too clean for us to pass as real miners. <coughs> I think I'm getting the black lung, Bob. Then we stripped again, showered, and changed into our minion clean room outfits. My camera gear got a thorough 45 minute wipe down. All of this to reduce the amount of radioactive particles that we might bring into the lab with us. Practically zero. She's clear. So now we're two kilometers underground. This might be the world's deepest electrical extension cord. We don't know. We are standing right now next to something that we have confirmed is the deepest version of that item on Earth. This is, ladies and gentlemen, the world's deepest flush toilet. 
Yes. Where is it going? Deeper? <laughs> it's kind of like a weird underground shopping mall in the sense that any way you turn, you're going to go to something completely different. So we might go this way to go detect supernovas. And if we take a left, we're going to go detect the neutrinos that came out of the sun eight minutes ago. And if we go right, we're going to find out whether or not low doses of radiation are helpful or hurtful for life on Earth. So we use a human cell line, which is a hybrid cell line. It's a cross between the HeLa cells, which are immortal uh, cancer cell line, and a normal human epithelial cell line. So they're really useful because they will quickly transform into a cancer cell line, even though they're not normally. So if they have a kind of stressor that makes them want to transform into a cancer cell, they'll do that very quickly. And so by removing the background radiation and comparing how their transformation rates are with respect to those that are in a normal background, we can then kind of infer whether or not normal background radiation is harmful or beneficial or just useless or does nothing right. to normal cell function. Um, our preliminary results have kind of shown the somewhat counterintuitive answer that the background radiation actually prevents the transformation. Sub-background stored samples did have a higher expression of certain proteins that are indicative of higher cancer rate. Mike and his team have also repeated this experiment with yeast and got very similar results. That is to say that when everything else was equal, the yeast that was exposed to the regular bombardment of radiation fared better than the yeast that was protected from that radiation. Their next experiment is going to be on worms. How groundbreaking is this research? These are just a few experiments and our, a lot of our results are fairly preliminary, so we don't want to say we're entirely groundbreaking just yet, but we are making strides to, to get there. What led you guys to, to even have the hypothesis that, um, you know, that this ultra low dose environment may not be beneficial? One of the good examples is the community of Ramsar in Iran. In this area, natural background radiation reaches 200 millisieverts a year the highest in the world, and significantly higher than anywhere in the Chernobyl exclusion zone. What we found was that people who lived in the high background areas had significantly fewer induced chromosomal abnormalities than their neighbors who lived maybe just a few kilometers away where background radiation levels were normal. It appears that radiation may actually help the body resist genetic damage. If the results at Snow Lab are replicated, it has the potential to relieve oodles of human concern and resources currently dedicated to avoiding very small doses of radiation. Japan has announced that it will start releasing massive amounts of contaminated water from the Fukushima nuclear power plant into the sea. For one example, a recurring global news controversy that gets revived every few months is Japan's plan to dump over a billion liters of water from the Fukushima cleanup into the Pacific Ocean. The water has been treated to remove all the radiation radioactive elements in it with the exception of tritium. The reason they can't get the tritium out is because it's actually part of the water molecule itself, the H2O molecule. The good news is, is that tritium is found in pretty much all water on Earth, and the Fukushima water has been diluted to the point where it is seven times less radioactive than the limit set by the World Health Organization's guidelines for drinking water. So much of the journalism being done around the Fukushima water dump amidst the these two key facts. So perhaps it's not surprising that the announcement has sparked protests around the world, both in the streets and from foreign leaders. It's actually one of the only things the governments of both North and South Korea can agree on, that they don't want Japan to dump that water in the ocean. All of this opposition is based on the belief that any increase in radioactivity is at least dangerous, if not catastrophic, for a system. Any radioactivity that's released into the environment will have a consequence. That only makes me confirm my hypothesis that the sushi is going to be radioactive for 20 to 30 years. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Your sushi is already radioactive. Just like everything else. A group that hasn't made the news very much are the nuclear advocates over on Twitter that started the hashtag Fukushima drinking team. In the case that Japan does end up not dumping the water in the ocean, they've offered to go drink it. This is after a professor at Tokyo University did the math and found out that if you were to drink eight glasses of Fukushima water every day, it would take you a year to accumulate the radiation dose that you would get from one overseas flight. 
If we find that background radiation is actually important for normal biological function, that would point towards the idea that a little bit of above background exposure is not only not harmful, but perhaps even beneficial to normal biological function. But there's a lot of work ahead for the folks at Snow Lab to confirm their preliminary results. And most of that work is about keeping that pesky radiation out of the little lead box. Because while the two kilometer of solid rock overhead does filter out the cosmic rays, cosmic rays only represent about 10% of the background radiation that we are exposed to on Earth. All of our air that comes from surface is aged for at least 30 days in order to allow most of the radon to decay before we start feeding it into our systems. We're living organisms, we have a little bit of potassium in us, we have a little bit of, well, a lot of carbon in us as well. And a small fraction of those two elements have a natural abundance of radioactive isotopes. So it's carbon-14 for the carbon and it's potassium-40 for the potassium. We've actually been able to eliminate the potassium-40 from our yeast and that gives us a much lower background for them as well. We could probably try and source low carbon-14, but I, that would just be an ridiculous. a ridiculous cost. Okay. It's already uh, about $10,000 per gram for our refined potassium-39. Wow. And so it's already a fairly expensive experiment at that point. And the carbon-14 uh, dose contribution is actually fairly low, even in our sub-background environments. Okay. And so we're already getting up to a 1,000-fold reduction in natural background radiation in our yeast. Our biological samples are stored within 10 centimeters of lead as well. And this and lead was mined before the atomic bomb tests, right? Yeah, so it's all low uh, radioactivity with lead as well. Because the atomic bombs like uh, seeded the world with a little bit of like strontium and other elements yep. that worked their way into lead deposits, is that? Yep. I've heard that story, but I didn't totally understand it. That's my understanding as well. Okay. And yeah, so you have to pay a little bit of a premium in order to get the ultra low background lead as well. Should the team at Snow Lab ultimately disprove the linear no threshold hypothesis and show that low doses of radiation are either not harmful or perhaps even supportive of life on Earth, it will unleash waves of relief throughout the world, eliminating a source of horrible anxiety for millions Millions of people and freeing them up to focus their attention on other threats to our ecological well-being. This is absolutely how this will go down. Two, one, boosters in ignition and liftoff of Artemis 1. In the meantime, the team at Snow Lab is also collaborating with NASA's BioSentinel project, one of 10 mini experiment satellites that hitched a ride on the recent Artemis 1 launch. Once it escaped Earth's gravity, the tiny shoebox-sized satellite separated from the spacecraft and is currently carrying some brewer's yeast further than any biology experiment before it. Far outside the protection of Earth's magnetic field, the yeast is now absorbing Hulk-level doses of cosmic radiation and reporting its vital signs back to the scientists here on Earth. You can track BioSentinel and everything else ripping around the solar system on NASA's website. I put a link in the description. Speaking of getting off Earth, we here at Decouple are trying to reach our own escape velocity and break out of the internet's gravity well and reach way more curious minds that are out there. So while you're here, please go ahead and hit the like button or maybe the subscribe button or maybe even send this to a curious friend of yours or maybe an anxious one. And if you want to go deeper into the wacky world of radiation, you should check out Chris's interview over on the Decouple podcast with Doug Borham and Chris Tomei, also of the Snow Lab. That's it for now.